Angela Bassett. She did the thing. This is Flop Culture. You are very welcome to the show they call Flop Culture, a podcast where we mainly talk about flops, but we also talk bops, hot goss, pop culture at large, with me, your host, Fanula J. This week, we're talking about a TV show that did end up running for several seasons, but never quite got off the ground like its peers did. But first, some news. Okay, before we get into flops... Let's talk bops. Specifically, as I hinted at the top of the episode, Ariana DeBose at the BAFTAs this past weekend. Her rap honouring all the leading actresses and uh, supporting actress nominees brings me so much joy. I saw it first, I cringed. I see it now and I see Fesh Matthew. I see performance art. I see a lip sync for your life. I will say, I think... This kind of main response to it, I think, is something a little bit to do with the camera operator. I think the camera operator set her up a little bit with the camera pans. I think they came in a little bit too early for some people, so as to deliberately be shady and then stayed on some people a little bit longer. But I digress. Uh, I think coverage is kind of on the other way now, uh, in the sense that I think initially it was snarky, and now it's gone the other way, like positive, as it should be. But I do think it's gone too far the other way in some respects, because you have some Americans on Instagram just outwardly being like, Ariana DeBose put BAFTAs on the map, as if American award ceremonies are the only ones that exist in the world. The IFTAs found rotting. The Meteor Music Awards found rotting. I I don't give the Brits credit at the best of times, but like, let's let's not with that. The BAFTAs carry their own level of, of prestige, you know what I mean? Anyway, she's deactivated her Twitter in response to this and that makes me very sad because honestly, what a laugh she's given us all this week. She's won an Oscar and look, I will say some of the wordplay, quite clever. Kerry and Kerry with a C. I never, ever would have thought of that. That's all I'll say on that. Uh, Took a big swing. Ultimately, I think it hit. I want a full-length version of the rap. I want it on streaming. I want a TikTok sped-up version and I want a three-part Netflix doc on how the night came together. Ariana DeBose... You are everything, and you are a certified bop. From bops to flops, let's get into this week's flop. Ensemble sitcoms. You love them, you hate them, you love to hate them. Late noughties, early teenies, TV programming was full of them. One that regularly comes up in conversations on how it never got the credit that it deserved, Happy Endings, a three-season run which followed the lives of six friends living in Chicago. So far, so friends. Just replace Central Park with The Bean. Except for many, despite the show never fully getting off the ground due to scheduling changes, among other factors, Happy Endings stands head and shoulders above the so-called classics. To fight his corner, I'm joined now by LGBTQ plus activist and podcaster, James O'Hagan. James, it is my absolute pleasure to have you on this season of Flop Culture. How are you doing? I honestly, you do not know what you've let yourself in for. I have been <laughs> hounding and harassing people in every single friend group far and wide for the last, I would say, decade and a half. Well, or since 2011, at least for people to be like, watch Happy Endings. Listen, you need to watch Happy Endings. So this honestly could not be happier. Could not be happier, <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm, I'm delighted you picked it because as you just said there, your flop this week is... Happy Endings, the TV show. And it's a TV show that's evaded me for quite a long time, despite its reputation kind of nearly preceding it. You know, this kind of cultish sitcom that fans bemoan never really got a shot, even though like the content and the quality really stood up to the Mm -hmm. test of time. So for anyone who I suppose isn't familiar with Happy Endings, what is it about? So, I mean, it is a straight up and down, left to right, undeniable kind of hangout sitcom in the kind of how I met your mother, friends vibe, 100%. So the cast is made up of our standard six characters, three boys, three girls. You have Eliza Coop, who some people would remember from Scrubs, playing kind of the type A style Jane, who is kind of this like 
really straight-laced sort of uh, businesswoman who sort of it has sort of this Monica style of, uh, of, of personality. Her husband, Brad, played by Damon Waynes Jr., who had to sort of juggle his uh, his new girl uh, sort of tricks in order to be in this. Then there is Dave and Alex. Alex is sort of Jane's sister, and she is, I suppose, the, she is the kind of ditzy one, the goofy one, the sort of pretty girl who sort of, you know, gets into all these sort of scrapes and binds of just being a bit oblivious to the world around her. Dave, the kind of wannabe too cool for school restaurateur. Then Alex, are then Penny and Max, who are two of the greatest sitcom characters of all time. Penny Hearts, who is played by Casey Wilson in, in, in the role that she was built to play. I mean, most people know Casey Wilson probably from, some people will know her from Hot Wives of Atlanta, the like piss take of the, 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 um, Housewives. Most people know her from Bitch Sesh, the, the, the Housewives podcast. She is so naturally charming and hilariously funny. And then Max played by Adam Pally, who is the absolute sort of, opposite end of the gay stereotype. So he's a gay character, but he is not played in any way as we have seen kind of, you know, those characters played before. The show aired between 2011 and 2013 and I suppose it, it kind of turned things on its head because it did things in a, in a, in a it, it did things in a sort of a slightly different way. It took its lead more from like the likes of Community or even from like Family Guy and had this sort of like absurdist kind of uh, line to the humour. It starts out, the sort of main story is that Dave and Alex who've been together for for years and years and years are on their wedding day this douchebag on a pair of rollerblades rides into the church and says hey come with me Alex leaves Dave and then it's kind of set up to deal with the fallout of their breakup but I mean it quickly just abandons that and becomes your basic situation comedy and they get into all the usual sort of scrapes that you would expect kind of a, a group of friends in a, in a sitcom like that to get into and I mean I think that the thing that you the, the thing that you can't match with this like the thing that I think is, is unmatchable with a lot of other shows that come, come around in the same place is that it is just it, it is just the writing is so good and the cast's energy together is uh, un, unbeatable like they are so, you can tell watching it they are having an absolute blast being together and working together that's the thing because I'm going to be honest I watched the first episode and I wasn't it took a few episodes before I was like, I get it, before it started clicking at me. The longer I spent with these people, I mm-hmm. just became more and more obsessed with them. It became more believable. I think initially when you have kind of, kind of such an unusual, I suppose, pr- initial premise with the whole thing of they're a group of friends, two of them are getting married to each other, but then lo and behold, the, like Alex leaves Dave at the altar and you're kind of dealing with the aftermath of that, but yeah. it's all like quite comedic, quite light, light, will they, won't they, yada, yada, yada. But then, as I said, the longer you're with them, the more obsessed you just become with, I won't say all of them, because I'm going to be honest, and we'll get into it, Alex and Dave, I was still (laughs) never really sold on as individuals. No, and I don't, I don't, I I think that the, you know, I know we'll kind of chat a bit about why I feel or why, why we feel that maybe the show kind of flopped. And there's a lot of different reasons for that. But I do think that one of the reasons or one of the things that I think the show maybe didn't necessarily have or kind of hit straight away was that backbone plot line that ran the way through, like the Ross and Rachel characters or the, uh, I I can't even, the Alison Hannigan and uh, your your man who's uh, the big tall fella whose name I can't remember. Jason... Jason Siegel, yeah. Jason, Jason Siegel, that could be it. But you know that that sort of like that like steady kind of like will they, won't they? The kind of the 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 thing that even when all the shenanigans and tomfoolery is taking place, you always will come back and check in with this plot line across the rest of the season. And I don't think it ever really had that, and it never found its footing. It it, it never found the direction to go with that and they kind of played around with whether they were going to ditch that entirely and maybe sort of start sending Dave over Penny's way but then they I think they like got scared of that and moved back away from it yeah and it's, so I think that was one of the things that I think tripped it up because you are right those two characters never really kind of managed to hit the heights of the other four yeah you have Brad and Jane then who are just this Jane is just, again, you kind of should hate for all her neurosis, but I'm like, resonate with her to a degree, want to be her friend, kind of feel like she'd melt me as well. I want to be married to Brad. I want to be Brad's friend. And then you have like my crown jewels in this ensemble. And you mentioned there, Max and Penny, just... 
Penny, the every gal has lines coming at like the sharpest lines. Oh my God. The funniest st- uh, like storylines and kind of character development in a way. And Max, as you mentioned, eschewing that total gay stereotype. He's the biggest like slacker, slobby, like bro-ish type dude ever. It was just in a way it was like really inspired when you consider what we'd yeah. seen from sitcoms up to that point and how much they were lacking in a lot yeah. of ways, I suppose. And I think like what was really good, particularly with like with Max, because I think thinking back to kind of when I first saw the show um, and it, it, you you didn't see those kind of characters. I suppose you, you had like, I think at that time when it came to kind of gay representation, you had like Sarah Silverman's like Neighbours on the Sarah Silverman show. You had Cam and Mitchell on, um, on, on, on Modern Family, but none of them were really kind of like, they were all very timid and tame by how they would like either deal with sort of actual intimate relationships between queer people or how they represented people. And Max came along and was absolutely so out and proud in the fact that he was a gay man, but absolutely not in any way sort of the stereotype. And then also throughout the show, they were very knowing and kind of pointing to that. Like one of my favourite episodes, and I can't remember the name of the episode, is the episode where Penny is up the walls, frustrated, cannot believe it, that Max, her like gay best friend, isn't giving her everything she feels she deserves from a gay best friend. There's no farmer's markets, there's no brunches, there's no drag shows, there's no yas queening and shablamming before that was even a thing. And so he's like, okay, hold up, sis, and runs out, finds the most offensively gay stereotyped man that he can find. His friend D-Rock, who apparently he met in like a gay softball league, brings it back into her life. The two of them, like, just exp- Penny and, and, and D- Derek explode with this relationship of like, oh my God, this is perfect. We're so camp and amazing for each other. But over the course of the episodes, she realises, oh, actually, no, this guy's too much for me. But not actually that he's too much for her. It's like, no, she's already the gay stereotype stereotype she herself is the gay husband to max and it just i mean you know it it is it's a quality a quality episode yo penny girl that dress looks delish what things that make you go "Mm." (laughs) gracias max who is this fine man penny i'd like you to meet Derek. played on a gay softball team together last year you guys might get along. P.S. Four balls isn't just a walk, it's a party. What drama? <laughs> Did I touch your tata? Get in there. <laughs> oh my god, I feel like I've known you so long. Oh my god, oh gosh. I already miss you. Oh my god. Are we in a fight? No, I'm gonna go get your accessories, get okay? Out of here, Bye. You. All right, see you soon. <laughs> gay enough for you, Pen? Slut, come help me out of this split. He's the gay of my dreams. You have to listen back to the Zencaster recording to find my impressions of Penny there. <laughs> I'll probably have it on your original file, so we'll we'll stick it in here somewhere. I just, oh, I ju- Adam Pally, who plays Max. I've just totally fallen in love with him. He's just and he's done. It's very funny. It's kind of gone in a roundabout way now. I don't know if you've seen that he did like the last season of Z Way's talk show where she's kind yeah. of being like, "Do you want to do you want to apologize for you know any of the roles you've ever taken?" And he's like. The, you know, the, if anyone's unfamiliar with Z-Way, it's like supposed to be like really awkward, kind of yeah. make you feel really bad, edge your seat, kind of cringe vibe. And she's obviously hinting at the fact that because he is straight in real life and he's playing this gay character, it's very, I'm just obsessed with him. I want to shag him and be his wife. Um, but I'm just absolutely. obsessed. Yes, absolutely. He, it's, it's, there's just, there's so many moments and I, I find myself coming back to Penny for a lot of them. She has a lot of great lines. Even the very start of the season, there's a moment where they're in the gym. Alex and, Alex and Ping have just split up and it, the way, and they're in the gym and this really young doll comes over to Penny about using the machine and she's like, I'm going to go ball my eyes out and then I'm going to come back and smack you in the face. Like it's just, <laughs> she is she is there's a whole other thing where she thinks her apartment is haunted because she and with the spirit of like the spinster lady and she's going to be a spinster lady forever Uh, another one because Alex runs like a clothes shop and she starts stocking these baby Baby t-shirts but like oh my god yeah baby girls but young girls start wearing (laughs) them and it's like and they all start taking on these like high school demeanors to like react to the girls it's just it is so good. It's so sharp. The pop culture references in this are chef's kiss. Cause I find when I come back with shows like these, mm-hmm. some of them, some of them age fine and some of them don't. And like, there's a couple of these. I'm like, these will probably be dated in like yeah. 10, maybe five years. But like there's references to the good wife, but a blue, a really funny line on blue bloods. <laughs> it's just, it's a very, 
it's very on the pulse in a way that I suppose some of its peers, maybe the likes of community, the guys that were behind this were also responsible for scrubs in ways that maybe they're not, if that, they, yeah. they're not anymore, if that makes sense. Yeah, I, I feel like the pop culture references in here also kind of, the, it, it's not the, we said the word that will make you laugh. It's the the context of the joke actually gives you enough to understand, even if you're not 100% sure what the show is or what the reference is, you still get it by the context of where they are. Like one of my one of my favourite pop culture references was in the, in, in like the third season, there's an episode where, um, where called Big White Lies, where one of Penny's sort of like frenemies comes into town and Penny is trying to avoid her but doesn't want to be seen as being the bad person because Penny needs to be liked by everybody. So she starts telling these lies and the lies start getting more and more and more out of control. And before the end of the episode, you know, Jane is having to pretend to be pregnant. Brad is after pretending to have like getting his, like, buying a lake house and getting a fumigated. Dave is dying. Max is, uh, is, is doing something else. And they start making all these references to the TV show Revenge, which had, um, <laughs> which had like, which had sort of started around that time. But you don't need to have seen Revenge to understand why what they're saying is funny but if you have seen it it's just at this like other level of like intelligence to, like it, it was it is just I think that's the thing that like there was there was a knowingness put through it and the jokes are piled so high like it is literally you know you, you were literally just recovering from one belly laugh before the next one comes along like one of my I, I, I still recall one of the and also like the catchphrases like some of these catchphrases have lived in my mind now since 2011 but there was like the episode where uh, where Penny dates or where Penny like meets a guy whose surname happens to be Hitler and they're like the way they they layer this up into this like kind of like this comedy of errors through like and like it feels like you shouldn't be laughing at it but like when you get to the kind of the big revelation at the end kind of like first of all it's like it, 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 it's just I, I know that hearing another person explain a TV show they love and why is never necessarily kind of like the funnest thing to listen to but it it is a it is a a TV show that will just leave you so happy and contented and fulfilled. It is positive and light and entertaining, and you can re. I've rewatched it about five or six times over the last like kind of couple, over the last maybe I suppose like ten years since since it first came out. Like I remember getting into it for the very first time uh, when it was on. It was on like E four in twenty twelve, and I happened to catch it and then like had my like UPC box recording the rest of it for me and like watched it at that point and was able to go back a couple of times and watch it at like various times where like there was one time where I just had had surgery I was able to go back and rewatch it and it like really helped me at that point there was a time where I I, I mean almost like a Penny Hearts style of of scenario in the earlier days of Grinder, I would sort of had ended up chatting to this guy who was in Wales and we'd gotten on when we talked for the one night and then the next day he booked he, he messaged me to be like oh I'm getting the ferry over can you meet me to, down at like the point so I had to like go down <laughs> and meet him off the ferry got home zero sexual chemistry <laughs> Tree, zero fucking interest and the pair of us were I was just like oh you know what we'll fix this happy ending <laughs> <laughs> and it did oh my <laughs> god <laughs> what an incredible introduction to the show yeah. oh my god so I wonder will he he'll now probably be like oh my god that show I watched that weird time and he'll find this podcast and be like hey he thought there was no sexual chemistry <laughs> <laughs> I'm obsessed I'm obsessed because you you've watched it, rewatched it so many times, I'm curious to know how I suppose your most recent rewatch compares to your initial impressions of it. If you can cast your mind back to then, yeah. So, like initially, I just couldn't understand why this show wasn't huge, and like you know, it's as if kind of this that my entire life has been leading towards us having this conversation right now, Fanilla, because as it happened in 2011, uh, myself and a friend of mine did like this big American road trip and finished up kind of in like September down in LA and the kind of the the billboards and all the rest down there were absolutely blowing up uh, for Whitney and for Two Broke Girls and for New Girl, which were all the sort of shows that started in around the same time and there was just no advertising for happy endings whatsoever and I remember kind of like putting two and two together and realising oh this maybe is why it hasn't so far but at that this is maybe why, part of why it didn't manage to get that audience because it didn't have the weight behind it but so watching it at that point I just like I was an e I was evangelical I was like why is nobody understanding that this is the best television show on 
that has, this is the best comedy sitcom comedy that has like ever been released. This is amazing. Watching it now, I suppose I can understand what I really love about it. But I think it, I I I now sort of seeing. I now understand that where we were at that point was kind of in this like dying days of the monoculture. And so like things needed to be friends level of successful in order to get carried on, in order to get that weight put behind them. This wasn't a show that had sort of a an SNL star at the helm of it. This wasn't a show that had like a super big person kind of like as the, you know, this is the celebrity who is doing this show. It was kind of like a ragtag bunch of kind of people who had like moderate profiles, but nothing really massive. And so therefore it kind of, it didn't get the same maybe opportunities as it did and I think watching it back now what I really think is this needed to have its Shit's Creek moment this needed to maybe be like two or three years later to be sat in that moment where it kind of was ready for that slow burn cult classic status and the problem is now that it's not even going to get it's not getting that because it's so unavailable like it is so hard to actually find it to watch it I don't know if that answers your question, but it's what I no, want to it say does. in the moment. And, <laughs> uh, it, it, it brings up a great point because it was just outside of that window of, as you said, the end of the monoculture, but just before kind of really good streaming and how streaming has allowed people to find new audiences. Shit's Creek is the perfect example. You know what yeah. I mean? It's just, it's a real shame. And the whole issue of it not being readily available here I am going to mention this after our chat but like yeah th- th- wherever you watch it I don't want to know about it don't tell me <laughs> it's illegal well, you didn't listen to this podcast none of this happened but it's just a shame because it is like the writing does it does stand up like it's it, like and again if you're like me and you watch maybe the first episode maybe two and you're like oh, I'm not really getting this just trust me, stick with it. These guys are so much more likable in a way that it's funny how we've had this retroactive moment with friends, because again, I think yeah. that's the only other comparable thing where a lot of people are looking back now and being like, actually, I don't know if I really like friends or like, you know, I can't actually really relate to any of these characters because they're all melts. You yeah. know, it's it's really, it's really unique in that sense. Like it's, yeah. I can nearly see parts of myself in all of them. Yeah, and I think and I think that's the kind of thing. It's like the when they were writing it, they understood that. Or, or, I mean, I was in the room, but no, they understood that <laughs> the that the uh, that like each of these characters is a stereotype. They they are an archetype of a character. So what they did was they amplified with the like the, like because they sort of uh, leaned in like it was like it was like an alternative friends, like more alty than friends. They leaned in to the the freedom that being a bit more alt gave them so that they could really like do some stuff that feels completely ridiculous. But at they also allowed the characters to develop real heart. So there are people that you cared about and you related to, and they were relationships that you believed. So, you know, you could have like a, a like a, a ridiculous kind of like storyline about, you know, you have a, a ridiculous episode based around the fact of like there being some like massive lie or, or the fact that the friends are trying to create a, a fight between Brad and Jane and, 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 and like that they've got like, they're, they're getting like little t-shirts made up for it, but also be like, I love these characters. You know, it, I, it, I think that's the thing about it it's that like the characters are relatable and that you can fall in love with them but they're also able to be over the top ridiculous caricatures what's your favorite episode I know we've mentioned a couple of different moments so there's a, there's a couple of them I think one of my favorite episodes and this comes back to the max thing and, and actually how I suppose important it was to maybe see a character a gay character a queer character like on screen who wasn't sort of like pop in for one episode and like die of AIDS or like help a police procedural solve a missing <laughs> prostitute kind of a thing I don't mean to laugh but I mean it's, it's <laughs> you know I've, I've actually been, I've, been, I've been re-watching Cold Case at the moment I don't know if you've ever if you ever heard or have, or have watched that there's a lot of episodes where like the like zinger is he couldn't have done it he was a puff but um <laughs> oh, <Jesus> Christ. <laughs> but it's okay for me to say that people check my credentials he's gay but, <laughs> he's fine he's fine he's off the hook guys he's gay don't cancel me please um <laughs> but 
<laughs> but there's an episode called The Valentine's Day Massacre, which is one of those ones where, again, there's such heart in the episode. It's completely ridiculous. Brad is planning this massive, um, this massive Valentine's event for, for Jane, but he has to go to the dentist. He gets hopped up on dental drugs and ends up being completely, you know, out of his mind for the thing. Max has bought a limo to, in order to kind of start, you know, raking money off people for that and ends up like picking up his ex-boyfriend and bringing his ex-boyfriend and his ex-boyfriend's new boyfriend to this restaurant and there's a lovely little meet cute between the two of them and you realise that there's a tension there they show like clips back to the relationship they have and sort of the tenderness and there's just a moment where even though at that point you had sort of Mac, Mitch and Cam and Modern Family had been on television for the kind of the last maybe two or three years of Modern Family you, you you got like a tenderness and a physical intimacy between Matt and and his his sort of boyfriend to be in that moment that you never saw on on television and you saw all of the other characters respecting and really kind of wanting Max to find that love and not have it treated like none of the straight male all of the straight male characters were rooting for him and wanted him to kind of you know find so that I really loved that episode for that reason because I felt like it, it showed here's a way to have humour about queer people without it being directed at queer people um, the, there's another amazing episode which has like given me like literal like kind of uh, catchphrases that I carry forward into my life was an episode called Cocktails and Dreams where Dave's ridiculous uh, food truck uh, gets a liquor licence and he opens a kind of a, 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 a sort of a a street style twenties cocktail bar, and it, it, Colin Hanks comes along and is like, you know, sort of like, oh yeah, this is real cool. And, and himself and all Colin's Han Colin Hanks' friends sort of set up, and all of the rest of the gang except for Dave are like dealing with some other thing that Dave isn't aware of. So he thinks his friends are ditching him because he's now got celebrity friends, and he keeps on talking to them about how I know you guys are jealous of my crazy rocket ride. I know my rocket ride might feel like a bit much right now, and for, like since that moment, anytime I have even the slightest amount of success over anything it might be like winning 50 euro or it might be like winning 50 pence on a, on a scratch card or like you know finding a fiver on the ground I'll be like okay look guys I know where my rocket ride is taking off right now but like it's that's one of my favourite episodes as well and then there's one called the, this is again I'm like I'll just explain them all uh, there's an episode called The Kirkovich Way which is in season 2 they decide I think to kind of Give Alex, give Alex and Dave a go. They put the, two, the, the the those characters kind of back together to see what that works out as. So after a one night stand hookup, Alex goes to her or to her sister Jane and is like, "Listen, I need you to help me out of this. He cannot know that we hooked up." So it turns out that she's actually been ga like Jane has actually been gaslighting. Brad for years anytime something happens that she doesn't want and she has these like real meticulous ways of doing it it's all about them sort of you know trying to make Dave believe that they hadn't hooked up but uh, yeah they're honestly just throw a dart at a dartboard and you'll land on one of my favourite episodes <laughs> Fair I, I think I've mentioned mine the one with the the baby girls in the shop uh, the, the work wives one where like Brad and Jane are competing with their work yes. wives and husband mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, what is, there was another one uh, where Max is gets the job as Santa is very yes. enjoyable <laughs> very enjoyable uh, this is slightly off topic but just as it's come up twice uh, did you watch Modern Family? Yeah, I did. Yeah. And I, I enjoyed Modern Family. Like I, I I did really genuinely enjoy it. Like I and you know, for you know, like I, I think that having Mitch and Cam was like a really significant thing and their family was shown to be kind of like by and large like loved and accepted and included within there was a lot of grocery so it was really positive like I'm not I am and like kind of like kicking it too bad like it, it, oh, it they're, no, they're... and that's it, it was more it was just as you brought it up because like on TikTok at the minute there seems to be this well I don't know if it's retroactive or if it did fans always think this but a real thing of like reviewing uh like or basically the just basically saying that Mitch was the most toxic mother manipulative motherfucker ever in that relationship. Like he's really people I feel no, I feel like that's just TikTok in general. You pick pick a day, pick a show, someone will have a video essay up of it on TikTok where it's like, here's why Mitch is the fucking worst person in the world. In episode six. But anyway, that's I was just wondering if you had any strong opinions on that because it, that's my for you page right now for some reason. <laughs> well, yeah, I, I, I mean, on, on Mitch, I always did think that because the show needed, like, it, it, it had to really go out of its way to prevent Mitch and Cam from having like any kind of intimacy because obviously they felt like their audience wouldn't be ready for it or wouldn't want it or that there might be a negative reaction to it. They had to make him into this kind of like, like 
this incredibly sort of prickly, unlikable person and just make him very, like, judgmental and standoffish because that's the only way. Like, you never really got, like, I, I felt like, you know, not that we were talking about happy endings, but to go on a, a happy, uh, on, a, on a modern family rant, like, I felt like you understood why Jay and Gloria were together. You saw the love that had been developed there and the sort of, the, the, the sort of, the why their relationship was so solid. You saw the same with with, uh, with Claire and Phil. And I don't feel like you ever really got that with, with Mitch and Cam. You kind of were like, these are two sort of, you know, comedy characters put together. You, you saw the love they had for Lily, but you never really got to see them develop a relationship. And I feel like, like, even when they got to the point where they had that kiss, like, this is the thing, the difference between Happy Endings and Modern Family in that capacity is like, a number of times throughout this series, Max has random lads and random boyfriends. And like, he'll give them a little peck on the cheek or he'll like give them a kiss on the lips. Or he'll, whereas there was this like season long build up to a kiss, but like a, a literally like a peck on the lips between Cam and, and, and Mitch. That sort of was like, I don't know, felt like as if it was, it was very much kind of kowtowing to an audience of people who really don't want gay characters on TV or only want gay characters on TV so long as they're completely desexualized. Back to happy endings. <laughs> what did you think of the... <laughs> yes. <laughs> yes. We can submit my thesis on Modern Family. <laughs> I absolutely day. agree. I do absolutely agree, for the record. <laughs> um, well, on happy endings, the show ran for three seasons, um, did not get the further success that it, that I think you and I would argue it deserved. Yeah. The ratings really started to dwindle, especially for that last season, even when I was looking at it and it was something... Uh, the executive producer is Jonathan Groff. Not that Jonathan Groff before anyone mm-hmm. thinks of that. He was like a showrunner on Scrubs and David Cast was the creator. They were they talked about it for some outlet around the time that it was finishing up and they were kind of be- bemoaning the fact that, look, this didn't deserve, I don't think it deserved like crazy 25 million views, but it definitely mm-hmm. deserved more than it was getting towards the end of its run. But I suppose my question is, what did you think of the show's ending overall yeah and I think I, I think that it was a show made like I, not ahead of its time and that it was doing something that was like it's kind of what I said already in that like I think it if you had that show a couple of years later where the pressure for ratings wasn't really as on and sort of like you know it, it, it was able to kind of you know spread out a little more be a bit more of itself without worrying about that also like it really was a case of like the little engine that just couldn't overcome all of the obstacles that were put in its way like I mean you know it was the first season arrived out and the decision was made by the network for whatever reason to run the, the episodes in like a weird order. So if you're watching them, you'll notice that there's like massive continuity like issues and like it, that is quite jarring to watch. I think I watched, it was only when I was kind of researching and looking back, like I think I watched season two in the in the fucked up order, to be honest. Like <laughs> yeah. it was, when I was reading it back, I was like, this is not the order I watched it in. But anyway, yeah, yeah. there you go. That Like that's, that would destroy a show. Like you'd never, Never get that with the show uh, in in this year and with this uh, and with the sitcom. No, absolutely. Because like, I mean, even though like the continuity is, is is small enough stuff, it still is important to your understandings of like the characters' stories. And like you know, then there was like it got moved around in the uh, it got moved around a good bit in the uh, in the time slot. So I think they they cancelled the show midway through, and so they decided, okay, for two weeks we're going to have two episodes a week, and then we're going to move it to a Sunday night, and then it's going to be up against this other thing. For so it just it just had all of this like in the moment where it came out. You know, as I said as well, like Casey Wilson was probably the best was would have been one of the best known comedians within the show she was coming off SNL at that moment in time like you had like Portlandia um, it, I think is a good comparison for it because it kind of had that like absurd sort of side to it but also it never had the expectations and Fred Armiston as well from SNL so Casey Wilson came into the show just off of SNL and she sort of now joins, I suppose, the 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 ranks of the likes of, of Tina Fey and Amy Poehler and Fred Armiston, who have those big shows that have managed to do really well because they had that massive kind of name banner hanging over it. But because her run on SNL hadn't done so well, she hadn't been so happy with it. She never really, like, I, I don't know that the sort of, the there was a trust that actually maybe she could carry it. Elisha, uh, Elisha Cuthbert, who sort of was, I suppose, the biggest name going into it, came from like, 
like a weird string of like kind of Halloween films like House of Wax and, uh, and, and like The Girl Next Door and she was like you know the daughter in 24 so it was just like such a mismatch of stuff and I think that because at that time the networks were still a bit like oh this needs to perform on this level in order to be a success success they weren't understanding what success was. and the frustrating thing is that I think that the creators of Happy Endings understood where things were going because mid in between seasons they created these like mini kind of like YouTube series called Happy Rides where I think it was like six episodes each of like just like tr- driving trips for that the, the cast were taking that like were being put online they were pushed out through social media and so like you kind of see like this that's an engagement strategy that like is something that is used much more now and that would really work now but at the time people didn't understand that and so yeah to 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 finish my point wrong place wrong time (laughs) and then in terms of the storyline then I suppose again it's really difficult because you'd imagine there was a hope that there would be another season because it does like I'm only gonna speak for myself here I find it quite flat but the, with the caveat that it's like they obviously the hope was that there would be another season yeah. what did you think about where the characters were left yeah I, I agree with you and that I think it was quite flat and I think one of the, the big problems that they, they kind of like they, they kind of struggled with like lost season three vibes kind of the entire time and that like they were really good at the like the jokes in the moment they were really good at the kind of you know putting together these single episodes or like maybe a two or three episode arc that would have something but there was nothing really like there was no sense of forward movement for any of the characters really the the main question of was like the will they won't they with 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 Dave and Alex they got back together in a really unbelievable way i felt towards the the end of of the second season and then into the into the third season and so all, all of the characters were were just sort of left kind of as they had been when you arrived in like Brad and Jane i suppose at the very beginning they were discussing buying a house in the suburbs and having children and settling down. And I know that that's kind of death knell to like a sitcom situation because it brings it into something completely di- different. So the characters kind of had to stay where they were t- in order to, to continue moving forward. But like, it just felt like, it, it, and then I suppose you needed Penny and Max to sort of stay the disasters in order to bring in the new characters or bring in the new storylines. So I, I in, in the end of it, I, I kind of feel like they needed to sit down and have a conversation about like what actually, what direction is the show going? What's the main plot line? Is it that we're going to commit to this idea that there's this underlying love story between Penny and uh, Penny and Dave? Is that what we're going to do and we're going to try and build that? Or are we going to genuinely try and show people why they should root for Dave and Alex to get back together? So I felt like, yeah, I agree with you on that. I think that like it was left a bit flat at the end. And, you know, it felt to me watching the third season like they sort of had an inkling that the writing was on the wall and that maybe they were just kind of fulfilling single episodes and really comedy ways without a real view on the future because maybe they kind of felt like maybe there isn't one. Can you ever see this being rebooted? I, I don't know. And, and this is like... I, I think that like the this is like you know for for my former stomping ground of 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 drag race it's like this is like that queen who comes into the competition that has absolutely everything except a completely busted wardrobe and so all they need to do is come back to all stars with the new looks and they'll absolutely slay the game so in an, in in one way I do think yeah it, they could come back and do it again they have the thing that you really can't capture uh, easily in the in the 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 um the relationship that the characters have but but also i do think that what it would need to be now would be very different because even though like we've moved we've moved on a lot now and how we talk about things and how how like humor and comedy is and that like kind of quick flash kind of comedy that does have an edge of sort of you do hear some jokes now that certainly at the time I would have been like, that's fine. There was ones that was like, Arr. yeah. So it would be a very different beast if it was to come back now. And part of me kind of thinks that it, as much of an evangelist as I was for its resurrection back in the day, now I'm kind of thinking, do you know what? It should just be made really much more widely available so that people are able to actually watch the episodes that are already there. Like that's enough. Okay, let's live in a hypothetical world for a second and let's say it is rebooted and it's and it's perfect and it all goes so Everyone's well and brilliant. all the <laughs> and all the jokes are in good taste and it's and it's great and we don't have to we don't have to have another debate about why fat phobia is bad. Um, let's say it's all perfect. Where would where would you visualize these characters being now? 
I yeah so I, I actually I, I would love to see them kind of not too distant from where they actually were I think that Jane and Brad absolutely having a family and Jane kind of coming to terms with needing to now balance her like really prop like manicured life with the sort of you know mess factory that is like having children and trying to like come to terms with that and perhaps now coming to terms with the fact that like Brad has gone very easily to like adopt a fatherhood where you know she maybe is finding more difficult I would love to see Penny in a like a happy and content and solid relationship that is kind of you know that like that she can second guess and worry about but is always sort of a bedrock I would love to see Max in some kind of like I don't know zaddy trouble situation kind of like having kind of <laughs> somehow managed to look himself into to, to be a bit more well off and and then for for Dave and Alex I would like to see them I, I almost think maybe for it to, to work in that way maybe one of them would need to not come back so maybe like Dave is off like living in Europe and is constantly like this you know he's taken his his uh, his take me home truck on the road and like he he's off somewhere else and we hear about him but we don't see him and then Alex could have a new love interest or like have a new kind of storyline or have brought her like her career to a different level or something like that I think that would be an interesting thing to see each of them to have actually moved on to the next stage of their lives kill Dave or Alex off basically I'll be fine I'll be <laughs> yeah, fine exactly. then yeah exactly send them to Europe send them upstairs to wash their face Coronation Street style <laughs> send, yeah send them to the farm they're on the farm <laughs> James, it's been a joy. I, before I let you go, I need you to give your elevator pitch as to why this isn't a flop and why everyone should be watching Happy Endings, despite the fact that it is that it is not readily available. And I don't know where you can watch it. Don't ask me. And don't ask James. We don't know. <laughs> I watch it in my heart, people. I watch it in my heart and soul. <laughs> <laughs> I replay the memories in my head. Yeah, exactly. Um, well, first of all, I've, I've got a very important question, which is that if Mary Tyler Moore was to marry and divorce Stephen Tyler and then marry and divorce Michael Moore and then get into a three-way lesbian relationship with Mandy Moore and Demi Moore, would she go by the name, the, the name Mary Tyler Moore, Tyler Moore, Moore, Moore? <laughs> Nobody, um, nobody did it like Abby and me. Sorry, <laughs> nobody did. <laughs> but I, I, I don't know. It, it, there is. A, that's my elevator pitch. That's my elevator pitch, right there. I think that's all you need. I really think that's all you need. Such a good pick. Such a good comfort show. Uh, delighted to have you here. Where can people find out more about you and the really important work that you're doing? you can come over and look at me on Instagram um, I don't do much these days except post pictures of my boyfriend um, so you know That's get jealous of my, get jealous of my happy ending um, <laughs> but yeah I suppose I do I, I work for, with LGBT Ireland and we're trying to make Ireland a a, a better and a easier place to be a member of the queer community so just find a way if you feel compelled to do so find a way to support LGBT Ireland and the work that, that we do yeah, pay up straight. You've had enough. <laughs> exactly, yeah. <laughs> That's what I say. James, it's been a pleasure. You'll come back and do something else, won't you? Oh, absolutely. There's another there's another TV show that I'm thinking I might make you watch. You okay, know. don't say it because I keep I keep asking people in the name. No, actually don't say I love the surprise. <laughs> I can't wait. James, thank Silence. you so much for joining me once again on Flap Culture. Thank you for having me. A massive thanks to James again for joining me. And just to note, if anyone is out there looking for support, the LGBT Ireland helpline is there and ready to take your calls at 1800 929 539. And I will leave all details of that below in the show notes. Finally, who is top of the flops this week? You're a flop. Well, life comes at you fast because top of the flops this week is Megan Fox. It's not even her and Machine Gun Kelly together because she is the one acting... The gout. I don't really know how else to describe it. I used to think Megan was cool, right? A cool celebrity. A celebrity you classify as cool. A celebrity you potentially want to be friends with, hang around with. Doesn't really give the air of celebrity other than the fact that she's otherworldly good looking. Not to sound like the straight man that I was talking about on last week's episode. But now it's just this. It's just like I don't even know how to describe it. So basically, as I mentioned last week, she heavily hinted on social media that her and Machine Gun Kelly were broken up, right? She removed all pictures of him, bar one, copped that, then removed that picture. And she had this separate post up referencing a Beyonce song that is about cheating, Pray You Catch Me, 
using specific lyrics in the caption, caption about dishonesty, right? Someone commented on that picture saying, he probably got with Sophie, referring to Sophie Lloyd, his touring guitarist. Megan replied to that saying, maybe I got with Sophie. Then, as I also mentioned on last week's episode, they, but I didn't think I explicitly said this, they organised this pap walk for them to be seen leaving marriage counselling, couples counselling. Can I prove that they organised it? No, but it's pretty convenient. And I do strongly think the call is coming from inside the house because it's like, if it wasn't directly from her, it was from someone in their camp to be like, yeah, they're not well. How would you explicitly know they were coming out at that point? How do you know how long they were in there for? And I know they're heavily followed and stuff, but anyway, that's my theory. She came back to social media pretty soon after and said this. There has been no third party reference in this relationship of any kind. That includes, but is not limited to, actual humans, DMs, AI bots, or succubus demons. If I pronounce succubus wrong, succubus, don't message me. I don't care. She didn't say that, I did, just FYI. While I do hate to rob you of running random baseless news stories that wouldn't have been much more accurately written by chat GPT, you need to let this story die. She continued referring to that AI bot that is more famous than that Sophie. What was that android's name? Sophia, wasn't it? Everyone was worried about her for a while. She is. Chappy G- chat GBT has entered the chat and Sophia found rotting. Leave all these innocent people alone now, adding a prayer hands and purple heart emoji. She said that, turns off comments, and everyone's a bit like, okay, because it is a bit nuts that like, I don't know, the, the media immediately went to her, I suppose Sophie, being like, they cheated, right? But at the same time, the implication was that something had happened, someone had been dishonest. You then remove all pictures of the other person. People are going to go two plus two is four. I don't think, I don't think anyone made a massive reach or a massive jump there. Like, I don't think the media needs to be defended, but in some ways it's a bit like, I don't really get it. Sophie put out her own statement and was basically like, it's not true, I'm going to paraphrase. And then... Megan went on again to make this other statement to say that, I think it was a comment on one of Sophie's own posts, to make it clear that there was no bad blood between them. And she said, how is me making a joke in order to absolve this girl of a hurtful accusation somehow turn into a confirmation of it? I will never understand. Why are people so dumb? Sophie, you are insanely talented. Welcome to Hollywood. Your first unwarranted PR disaster. This is where she really loses me, right? You've now been baptised by the flames of fame. It only gets worse from here, unfortunately. Just ignore it as much as you can. Middle finger up. Your first unwarranted PR disaster that... (sighs) I just struggle here because the thing is, if you didn't really want this story to go anywhere, why did you reply to that comment about maybe he got with Sophie, whatever? Because there was more attention drawn to that comment. And I know she was clearly joking. But like, as someone who talks about like, welcome to Hollywood, knows the game. I think it would be less infuriating if she'd come back and just kind of pretended like it had never. It had never happened in a way that she's like, what Instagram? Like, I don't, I don't, who's Machine Gun Kelly? Who's Sophie? You know what I mean? I think there's a way to do it in more humour as opposed to turning around and being like, I cannot believe you thought that. You're absolutely insane. These people are so thick and they thought we were broken up and they thought you were involved. They're so crazy. Like it's very, it's very Facebook status. Some fools in this town, someone commenting, PM me hon. And then you go to PM them and they're like, I've no idea what you're talking about. You know what I mean? Like, this is MSM behaviour. And Megan, you are too hot to be engaging in this MSM behaviour. Like, I don't know if it's just from spending so much time with Machine Gun Kelly. I don't know if it's, if you were always like this and now you're just more online. I don't know if you're just, and it, the issue is, obviously Megan's been treated very badly by the media in the past. And I don't condone that. But there's, this is such a mess of a situation that I'm just... I'm not saying ignoring it is the right call because people will run off and tell stories anyway, but I can't help but feel like you turned a mirror to it and then made it worse. Like you had the magnifying glass 
under the sun and you were burning the ant. I'm not sure who the ant is in that situation. I'm not sure who the ant is in that stupid analogy, but anyway, flop behavior, like incredibly flop behavior. Just log off. That's another thing as well. If I was not only really good looking, really rich, I would not be on Instagram. I would not be on Instagram putting up notes, like no, screenshots of my notes app. Do you know? I'm still hoping for a Megan Fox, Fox Assant, but I think she, she needs to fully break up with him and her phone needs to be thrown into the sea. Thank you so much for listening again. Another week of Flop Culture. We are Flop Culture underscore pod on Instagram and TikTok. You can get in touch as always at helloflopculture at gmail.com. Rate the show five stars on Apple Podcasts to get a personalised pop of flop recommendation from my good self. You can also leave a five star review on Spotify. I'm nearly at 200 views on Spotify, so I'd really love if you could leave a review. Uh, and all our views help people find the show apparently and that's hugely appreciated by me this podcast has been edited by Adam Shanahan artwork by Brian Lambert until next week I'll talk to you then bye